born in old St. Louis. By the age of four, Dad knew he was the best little crack shot the West had ever seen. By the time he reached pubescence, he could outshoot all the adolescents west of Durango and north of Abilene. Farkas, Freddy Farkas, famous gunslinging deputy Freddy Farkas, Freddy Farkas, frontier hero to be. Then one day young Freddy Farkas stared at eyes as black and dark as night. The eyes of an outlaw well known throughout the West. Oh, the tough kid's name was Kenny and he, and he outdrew Freddy Farkas when he shot Freddy's ear off to prove who was the best. Now our hero Freddy Farkas with wounded pride and earless carcass bowed to the heavens to give up gunnery. He'd be better off, he reckoned, with a lifelong dream that always beckoned pistols, not pistols, and pharmacology. Farkas, Freddy Farkas, highest score on his SAT. Freddy Farkas, Freddy Farkas. Five-year college degree. After Fred matriculated, got his PhD and graduated, moved out to Quartz Gold and bought a pharmacy. Now he's a real prescription writer, and they don't know he's an ex-gunfighter. Locked up his memories, repressed them totally. But his peaceful new survival soon was shot to hell upon arrival of course gold school marm, the sweet Penelope. She has captured Fred's affection, but he's scared he'll get a huge rejection. Can't bear to tell her just what he used to be. Farkas, Freddy Farkas, frontier pharmacist bourgeoisie Freddy Farkas Freddy Farkas peerless earless and free Freddy Farkas? You was asking about Freddy Farkas? The man what saved Corskull, only nobody knowed it was him? Why, just hop up here on old Whitlin Willie's lap and I'll tell you all about it. Ow, e carn sarn it, a bit more to the right. That's got it, sit right there. Oh no, thank you. Now, if I remembers this right, it's been quite a few years. My brain's getting a mad rusty. Oh, that's right. It all started when Freddy went to open up the pharmacy one day, way back in the spring of 1888, as I recall. Henny Penny, she ain't. Rain barrels are such an important aspect of life in an arid, drought-scourged landscape like this. Water running off the building's roofs is channeled through gutters and downspouts into storage. Oh, wait a minute. This is just no whiskey barrel. Forget it. Billy, the town handyman and jack-of-all-trades, is boarding up yet another coarse gold business. The Dirty Sheet Hotel, the finest hostelry in all of eastern Madera County. Okay, so maybe it was only the best after that other hotel was shut down, but in its day, the Dirty Sheet was really something. Say, Billy, 
When did the old dirty sheet fold? <laughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Farkas. Why, just yesterday. It was a surprise to me, too. Nobody told me nothing about it until they gave me these boards. Mom's Cafe awaits the hearty traveler who has a thing for good food, but isn't afraid to eat here anyway. Morning, Helen. Pretty Farkas, since when are we on a first name basis? Only my closest friends may call me Helen. You and I are acquaintances, nothing more. Therefore, you should address me as Mom. Land's sake, I'm sorry, Hel- uh, Mom? That's better. Now, what'd you want? Well, uh, when I remember, I'll let you know. Honestly, some people. Howdy, Hop. How's the restaurant business? Pretty slow. Not much business. Seem like town closing up and blowing away. You've noticed that too, have you? Oh yes. First all the abandoned mine, then Asse office, then post office, then toll and thin shop, then theater, yesterday hotel. What next? Well, I intend to get to the bottom of this. Maybe hurry before Mom's next to go. Hop Singh not want to lose his job. It's an old empty can of P&W beans. The firm, crisp beans that smell as savory on the way out as they do on the way in. Hey, Mom! Would you mind if I took this empty can? If you must, I suppose there's more where that came from. In fact, I insist you take it. Get it out of here. I'm sick of the sight of it. Score! The Golden Ball Saloon is presently open. Since it only has swinging doors, it's always open. Well, if it ain't Sam Andreas, the bartender's bartender. If it's not, I'm having a severe identity crisis. How the heck are you? Tolerably well. Yourself? Can't complain. Pharmacy business seems to be pretty good lately. Ah, well the pharmacy business has always been a little too interesting for me to hear about, so, eh, don't be a stranger. Doc! Hey, Doc! Huh? What's that? Are you drunk again? Me? Drunk? Never. I'm as sober as the day I was plowed off my ass. I mean, the day I was born. You pick up the whiskey glass. Play it, Neville. Neville, in order not to lose track of the piece he's playing, says nothing. However, he raises his eyebrows as if to say, Certainly, sir, I'll be happy to play whatever selection you'd care to hear. And what's more, I'll make this old piano sound like a whole orchestra. Welcome to Course Gold, strangers. I haven't seen you around these parts before. You new in town? 
You hear the unmistakable sound of grinding and cracking teeth. You hear the splitting, tearing sound of six severely chapped lips curling up in ugly sneers. You hear the pop of knuckles as three trigger fingers flex in readiness. You decide your friendly offhand comments have been misinterpreted. It's a moose head, the only domestic brand Sam serves. It's a likeness of chastity. One of the girls over at Madame Overy's. She's so lifelike, you feel as if you could just reach out and touch her. And you'd save two dollars that way, too. Looks like somebody scratched, and badly, too. This is a credit. These weren't actually found in coarse gold in the 1880s, but if they were, they'd have looked a lot like this one. There's an ice pick stuck into a barrel here. Score! You pull the ice pick out of the barrel and gingerly place it in your pocket. Just don't bend over suddenly or you'll circumcise yourself. Of course, that won't be any skin off your nose. Wow, some of Dad Gum's magic elixir. This stuff can be used to cure a wide variety of conditions. The foremost being sobriety. Score! You surreptitiously swipe the elixir, looking around to see if anybody's watching. Fortunately, nobody is. One of Hyman Undertaker's coffins is lying in disrepair off near Reboot Hill. It looks like a cedar model number seven. Eternal slumber and no moths. This is the Reverend Sai Hallelujah's church. Nobody's going in or out. What with everyone leaving town, the Reverend seems to have lost his following. Yep, he's been de-flocked. You would never dream of stealing a candle from a church, but they wouldn't miss one of those puddles of candle wax. There seems to be something in the lock. You wisely reconsider your idea of pushing on the stained glass to see if it's still in good shape. Score! You take the key to the church. The outhouse has a signature half-moon cutout. This tank stores the whole town's drinking water supply. This is the old red schoolhouse, one of the few buildings that still seems solid and safe. It's Sissy playing on the slide. The boys call him that because his mother dresses him so effeminately. The ladder, held in place by a couple of old loose screws, easily comes away from the slide. You somehow cram it into your pocket along with the rest of the junk you're carrying. Way to go, Freddy. Wreck the little kid's playground equipment. If only they knew how good and true your heart is. Score! Hello, sissy. My, your golden locks are looking pretty today. Sissy glares at you with a look that says, I know a thousand ways to cause pain to a human body. You want to start counting? It's the old abandoned assay office, once owned by a subsidiary of the old abandoned mine company. Before the mine shut down, 
This is where you got your nuggets appraised. Now you have to go to Madam's for that. Morning, Dominic. Morning, Freddy. What's new? Uh, let's see. I finished reading A Century of Dishonor last night. Quite impressive. That Helen Hunt Jackson really knows how to evoke an image of the white man's treachery. Do you know how many treaties your people have signed and then broken in the past 20 years alone? Uh, excuse me, I, I heard someone calling me or something. The pharmacy door is locked. This ain't Mayberry, partner. The sign says Farkas Pharmacy. This must be the place. The sign says PP's Playhouse. Or it used to, anyway. Now it looks more like PP's Playhouse. The sign says Tall and Thin Shop. And hey, it's right. That's just about the tallest and thinnest shop you've ever seen. Someone with a higher IQ than most of the folks in town correctly painted Sheriff here. This puddle of candle wax from the church is suitable for chewing, but it tends to lose that churchy flavor after only a couple minutes. Hey! This looks just like the key to the front door of my pharmacy. Score! You unlock the door. Ta-da! 500 points. You're halfway through the game. Ah. Your diploma from the University of Hicksville School of Apothecary Sciences and other good guesses. The old alma mater. What memories. This is your pharmacy, where you work. Hence the name Farkas's Pharmacy. It's a tube of Preparation G, the Wells Fargo wagon driver's friend for over half a decade. You pick up a tube of Preparation G in the handy 25-ounce Krabby Elephant size. Ah, scratching right there sure feels good, eh, Freddy? Frederick! Why, Miss Prim, you sure are looking pretty today. Now, Frederick, you may call me Penelope if you please. After all, I think we're to that point in our relationship. She must be talking about the hayride you both went on last month. Or the square dance you both went to last week. Or the cow tipping expedition you both went on last night. Well then, to what do I owe the pleasure of your company this fine morning? Oh, this isn't a social call, I'm afraid. I have this rather important prescription Doc Gillespie gave me. I was hoping you could fill it as soon as possible. My pleasure, Penelope. Why, the poor dear. She must be suffering from the vapors, those injurious exhalations produced within the body creating feelings of hypochondria and depression. Her prescription is in Doc's usual scrawl and smells of whiskey, so you know it's authentic. Your authentic moose skin rug looks very attractive with those eyeglasses on it. 
It would have been a mite less lumpy if somebody had remembered to skin the moose first. You picked up this old armoire at the farmer's market. It gave you a hernia. So instead of paying the doctor's bills, the owner let you keep it. You stumbled onto this big old dresser at a moving sale and broke your toe. So rather than pay to have your toe fixed, the owner let you keep the dresser. In fact, you get all your furniture by accident. It's a claim check for a pair of boots. Your old cowboy boots from the before time. Before the accident, could it be? That's what you get for not opening this drawer for the past decade. Score! You pick up the claim check, your hand trembling with the memory of the last time you wore the boots that you traded for it. That monster, Kenny the Kid, looking down at you and laughing as your ear bled in the hot sun. You put those boots away, never to wear them again. And when you moved to coarse gold, you sent them to be cleaned and polished. That was years ago. They'd probably been lost or thrown away by now. It's a key! Hot dog, now we're getting somewhere! You take the key. Hot dog, now we're getting somewhere. This is the key to your roll top desk. You unlock the desktop. It's an interesting drawer. You wonder if it's made any famous sketches. You unlock the desk drawer. It's an old letter, cobwebbed, yellowed, and faded. Score! You take the letter out of the drawer. You lock the desktop. You never know who's gonna sneak in here and try to get their hands in your drawers. You received this letter a few years back from your recently dearly departed friend, Phil Graves. Dear Freddy, Thank you so very kindly for your gracious hospitality during my recent convalescence. The floor of your workroom proved a comfortable bed, and the stale pharmacy goods you fed me staved off starvation quite adequately. I must admit to being a little curious of your request that I retain your safety deposit key for you. I cannot imagine what you have secured in that bank vault that could create such strong feelings of both revulsion and endearment. However, I have done as you asked and taken your key with me. I vow to you I will never return this key to you, nor even allow it within your sight. I further swear to keep it with me wherever I go. On this you have my word of honor, for I am Ever your friend, Philip D. Graves. You study Penelope's prescription and prepare to carefully fill it. You wouldn't want to make a mistake with her medicine. This is where you concoct all your potions, pills, and powders. It's here that you truly earn the right to call yourself Freddy Farkas, Frontier Pharmacist.
you carefully label the container Miss Penelope Prim for internal use only. And what internals they are, you dream about them day and night. Thank you, Frederick. This looks perfect. You are a scholar and a gentleman. Aw, oh, shucks. I'm just a poor pharmacist trying to please my favorite customer. Will I see you again soon? I think that can be arranged, Frederick. See you soon. I'll be waiting. So long now, Penelope. Unfortunately, you were so taken with Penelope's angelic presence that you forgot to charge her the 19 cents she owed you. Good day, Freddy! Freddy Farkas! Well, good day to you, Ms. Back. What can I do for you today? Well, Freddy Farkas, Dr. Gillespie, that no good gin soap saw no lush wrote me this damn prescription that'll probably cost me an arm and a leg. Here, take it. The rock gut from that old wino doctor is making my new ensemble stink to high heaven, I want to tell you. Helen Back's prescription is barely legible due to all the whiskey spots, but you eventually decipher it. You study Helen Back's prescription and prepare to carefully fill it. You toss it into the waste receptacle. Carefully label the container, Mrs. Helen Back. Take three times daily just before meals. That's better, Freddy Falkus. That'll be 22 cents, Miss Back. Y'all just uh, put it on my tab. I don't have it with me right now. Short while later... Mr. Falkus! Yes, Helen? 
accidentally gave a bit of this so-called medicine to one of my pets, and it died. Obviously, this is not fit for consumption. Now, take back my prescription and get it right this time, or you'll feel the wrath of my handbag, I'll tell you. I'm so sorry, Miss Back. I'll take another stab at it, and I'll remove the charge from your tab until I get it right. You toss it into the waste receptacle. Carefully label the container, Mrs. Helen Back. Take three times daily just before meals. Score! That's better, Freddy Falkus. That'll be 22 cents, Miss Back. Y'all just uh, put it on my tab. I don't have it with me right now. Pretty Cherie, just slide that handsome pharmacist's butt on over here. I got something I need from you. Morning, Sadie. What have you got? Well, I got a prescription here I need filled. Something that'll increase my womanly powers, if you know what I mean. Be a dear and fill it for me right away, won't you? I simply can't wait to try it out. Your wish is my command, madam. You take the prescription from the madam. What a busy morning. You haven't had to fill this many prescriptions since Custer's troops stayed at the Dirty Sheet Hotel. This prescription is impossible to read. That's what happens when Doc writes a prescription through bleary, whiskey-soaked eyeballs. You stir the few remaining drops of whiskey around lick off your finger. Mmm, single malt. Now you can see this prescription the way Doc wrote it. Excuse me, Sadie. I've got to run out for a bit. Hang on, I'll be right back. Okay, Freddy, but hurry back.
What's the matter? You don't like your own name? So you want to take somebody else's? If you push this door, it might open. This sign says, Chesterfield's Mercantile Company. It may indicate there's a store inside this building. The door swings open. From the back, you hear Chester's voice. Help yourself. I'll be right out. Hiya, Whittlin' Willie. How's the whittlin' going? Hiya, Sonny. Just splendidly, thanks. I'm working on an old dead beach whale. It's gonna be my best work to date. Will it be for sale? Will it be for sale? No, it ain't gonna be for sale. I'm an artiste, dagnabbit. Besides, if I hang on to it for a while, maybe it'll be worth a bundle someday. Now scram. It's Whitlin' Willie. He's been here ever since you got to Coarse Gold, and he hasn't aged a day. He's always been about 140 years old. He spins a mean yarn, and somehow he always seems to know what people did, even when he wasn't in the room. This is a brand that used to be popular. Barrels of Chester Field's most famous smoked delicacies. It's a nice picture of a pussycat laying on its back. Severe wear non-clad kettles. It's a horseshoe from Chester's old swayback horse that got spooked by a wagon, ran into the street and broke its leg under the wagon wheel. Chester sent it to a veterinarian in San Francisco at outrageous cost, but in the end the horse died anyway, took every penny Chester had since the horse meat guy wouldn't buy the carcass. Guess he keeps the horseshoe up there for good luck. Considering that there's nothing for sale here, you wonder why Chester even bothers keeping these brown paper sacks around. Score! You take a complimentary paper bag. Yes, sir! Nice day, sir! Good to see you, sir! Smithy the village blacksmith is a real hulk of humanity. You know, Smithy, I've been wondering about that horse of yours. What happened? Corn sarn neighborhood kids, you just can't leave anything outside at night anymore without them stripping it right down to the axles. How's business, Smithy? Flatter than cow plop, Farkas. And you? Actually, I'm doing okay. Not great, but I'm making it, in spite of this mild economic downturn we've been experiencing. Bah, if it I could find me a buyer, I'd unload this dump in a sec.
This is the world famous Golden Ball Stage. Most days you can find major vaudeville acts here bringing their own unique brands of music, comedy, dance, and magic to the deserving folks of course gold. Some of the more popular acts include The Amazing Baloney, Bruce the Singing Sashay and Cowboy, Mimi Dottie and Franny the Singing Siamese Triplets with a Little Back Trouble, and Young Dogies in Love. You thrust the prescription and the whiskey glass under Doc's nose. Hey, Doc, this says testosterate. You really want to prescribe this to a woman? Testosterate? Hmm. No, I suppose that would be un if. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> a poor choice. Let's see. This was for Sadie Overy, right? Hmm, I must uh, I must have meant something else. L let me fix it. Ooh. Hey, there you go. Take this back to your pharmacy and have fun. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Don't come crying to me, George Bailey. I'm gonna swear out a warrant for your arrest. Hmm? That person's already working on another game. How? Yeah, yeah. Time for you shift over. Oh, please. You've been reading too many dime novels. Stop talking like that. Just trying to please the tourist, Herb. Sure, sure, tourist. Whatever. See you later. I'm going to go soak my corns. My people call it maize. Peace. How goes it, Pete? Just fine, Mr. Farkas, just fine. Sure is a nice day today. Yes, Pete, it's beautiful out. I was wondering if it might be possible for me to knock off a little early today. Something in particular going on? Well, it's just such a nice day. I thought I'd spend a little quality time with the buffalo. Maybe take them to Yosemite, let them run around and do some grazing. You know, the usual. I suppose that'd be okay. Sure, you can leave early. Just watch out for poachers now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny one, Mr. Farkas. I'll be sure to do that. Poachers. <laughs> like anyone would want to do that to Buffalo. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> I'm back, Sadie. Sorry for the delay. I just had to check out a few things. Perfectly okay, Freddy Hunt. <laughs> I was just admiring the way you display your goods. <laughs> Look who's talking. You study Madame Overy's prescription, fully amended and corrected by Doc Gillespie. You study Doc's corrections to Madame Overy's prescription and prepare to carefully fill it.
This is where you concoct all your potions, pills, and powders. This is where you can... Knock them together, but otherwise accomplish nothing. You carefully label the container, Madam Overy. Score! Why, merci, Freddy dear. That's gonna be 22 cents, Sadie, but for you, I'll make it 19. What do you say we just sorta take it out in trade? <laughs> I'm a mite short this week. Well... Why, thank you, Freddy. Ooh, you sweet potato pie. I'll catch you tonight, maybe, huh? Or if or. Hey, Farkas! My butt's killing me! He does know how to make an entrance, doesn't he? Sorry to hear that, Smithy. Yeah, so give me some of that preparation, G. Score! That'll be 15 cents, Smithy. But I don't suppose you can pay me. Are you saying I can't pay my bills fair and square, Farkas? Well, here, yeah, I'm gonna settle up tabs with you anyway, since I'm gonna leave in town. Here's what I owe you. Smithy pays you his tab. A whole four dollars eighty-seven cents. Holy moly, a windfall! You're rich! Well, kinda sorta. And if you takes my advice, you get out of this town, Farkas. Sheriff's closing people up right and left. Something stinks. And I mean them horses, because they're farting up a storm, I'm telling you. I was like to pass out. Somebody must have put something in their feed. I don't know what, but I tell you, don't go striking no matches out there. Good luck to you, Farkas. You was always one of the good ones. Good luck to you, Smithy. Your strong back and gruff but good-hearted demeanor will be sorely missed. But you was a strangin'. Fire inspection. I'm here to check out your fire safety per the new town regulations. Oh, look here. It's a good thing I came, Farkas. I'm gonna have to shut this place up tighter than a piss ant scrotum. But, Sheriff, how could you? What's the charge? I haven't done anything wrong. Fire hazard, my boy. Fire hazard. Why, this building's a terrible fire hazard. 
Looks to me like this whole damn building's made out of wood. But Sheriff, every building in this town is constructed of wood. I don't know nothing about that, son. Tough luck, Farkas. From now on, just keep the front door locked. But what am I supposed to do, Sheriff? This is my livelihood. If an eyes you, I'd talk to the bank. Good day. So Freddy was forced to shut down the old pharmacy again his will. But he vowed to keep the place up, knowing that someday he'd be opening it up again. Problem being, the sheriff, an ornery cuss if there ever was one, was doing this all over town. The hotel, the playhouse, the smithy, the tall and thin shop, closing them all down on some flimsy pretext. There was no telling who was going to be next. Who'd put the sheriff up to it? And what was happening with the horses for crying out loud? It were a mystery, says I. You swipe the town ice pick from out back of the saloon. Now no one will be able to pick their teeth. It's an empty can of beans. Why would mom keep an empty can of beans on her shelf? Well, mom's memory ain't what it used to be. With all the precision of a serial killer, you deftly poke some holes in the tin can with the ice pick. Ha! Having accomplished your immediate desire, and in the process hopelessly dulling the ice pick, you exhibit absolutely no regard for this barren piece of locality laughingly called the environment by brazenly tossing the ice pick away. You're such a consumer. You recall with fondness that wonderful old blacksmith who used to operate this shop. What the hell was his name anyway? <laughs> Here stands the only bank in town, the First Bank of Bob. The founder must have had a hard time coming up with an original name for his establishment. Smithy left behind a coil of rope. A length of leather bridle hangs on the smithy's door. Smithy's once proud forge is cold and dark. You know it does no good to close the barn door once the smithy's gone away. Digging through Smithy's formerly white-hot forge, you find an unused hunk of charcoal which you decide may well be of use to you. So you keep it. Score! You take the rope. Now that Smithy's closed up shop, he won't be missing it. Score! You take the leather strap. Smithy won't be needing it now, wherever he is. 
you swipe this handful of charcoal from the blacksmith's forge. Remember to wash your hands when you're finished playing the game. You drop the charcoal into the tin can. Now we're getting somewhere. Score! A rugged leather strap. Your mind reels with the possibilities. The whole ridden tin can is now chock full of charcoal. You slip the leather strap through the holes in the tin can. They fit perfectly. Congrats! You always wanted a tin feed bag. Score! Congratulations on making this homemade gas mask. Devilishly good work. Here stands the only bank in town. You take a few deep breaths from the gas mask, clearing your head and enabling you to go on a while longer. What may well be the most revolting idea you've ever had, you hold the brown paper sack up to the horse's anal sphincter and wait. With a reverberating, the horse responds, inflating your bag with a foul sample of gas. You quickly twist the bag shut to lock in freshness. Some buxom lady's portrait. Notice how the painting seems to follow you around the room. And I don't mean her eyes. It's a picture of some nearby big rock. Or reference bookshelf, complete with such top 10 medical reading as everything you always wanted to know about pustules but were too revolted to ask. Tyfe Lime book of blackhead removal, boil lancing and facial renovation. The dermatologist who came in from the cold sore, the 1882 edition of What Color Is Your Parasite, the One Minute Mandibula, a globe, and some souvenirs of your first customers. The alcohol lamp feels cool to the touch. The alcohol lamp is empty. You must first fill it with fuel before you can light it. Score! You fill the alcohol lamp with Dad Gum's alcoholic elixir. It's a bag full of something which does not meet California emission standards. Good idea, Freddy. The spectrum lines on that etched glass viewer reveal volumes to those who know how to read.
you toss it into the waste receptacle. You carefully label the jar aminophilic citrate. Congratulations, you've just created your first batch of Farkas's deflatulizer. It's your ordinary water trough. Favorite hangout of coarse gold horses and town drunks. In brighter days, this trough would be filled with sparkling, clear, pure mountain spring water. The kind they make into lousy domestic beer. These days, though, all you see in the trough is muddy, dirty, old stagnant water with a bunch of dead flies floating on top. You carefully pour the deflatulizer into the horse's water trough. The horses greedily lap up the delish and nutrish medicated trough water. Seeing as how his home-brewed patootie sealant done the trick on these horses, Freddy ran round and dumped the stuff into all the horse troughs in town. It weren't long before the folks of Coarse Gold was all breathing a sigh of relief. Freddy tossed away his homemade gas mask. Kind of a shame, too, since he could have made a purdy penny off the patent rights. Life returned to normal for a short spell, any hooch, until one lazy day when one of the local inbreds came a running up with the latest calamity. Board up your windows and doors. Lock up the women and children. Run for the border, Louise. There's a stampede a coming. A stampede! Hurry up, Freddy. You only got a week and a half before they get here. A week and a half? They snails! Snails? Snails? Good heavens, this is the worst thing to happen to coarse gold since the great hail of clams back in 83. Mom! Hey, Mom! Just let me guess. You only have one cavity, am I right? Huh? Uh, no. I wanted to know if you have any salt. There's a stampede of snails a-coming, and I mean to stop them. I don't know anything about no stampede. Unless they're stopping here to eat, I don't even care. As for salt, you know we're a salt-free community. That's why everyone's so uh, laid back. <laughs> Low blood pressure and we aim to keep it that way, son. Dang. Well, what could I use? Well, beer works for me. I just spread a little of it out along the back porch and them little buggers just follow it right off. Jeez, Mom. Thanks. Now get your ass out of here. Freddy Farkas, look what you all brought in with you. What's next? Honestly, I swung. Sam, there's a stampede headed for town. Don't go outside. We're open 24 hours a day, Fred. I never go outside. Besides, the sun dries out my beautiful skin. 
I'm just saying, you know, for your own safety. Oh, right. Tell you what, I'll stay in here and serve drinks and collect money. You run around outside like a chicken with your head cut off and save the town. Okay? Okay. Finally, you get your $4.87. Smithy's Pharmacy Tab is paid in full at last. Score! Hey, Sam, give me a case of the beer you just got in from St. Louis. One case of lowbrow for the pharmacist, coming right up. Sam hands you a case of lowbrow, the beer that gave St. Louis blues. Now, you know that this beer doesn't come corked, right? They're using some newfangled pinched metal tops. No problem, Sam. I'll take care of it. All right, fine. That'll be $4.87. Here you go. Nice bankroll. Come back any time. This is your case of lowbrow, the beer that gave St. Louis blues. All 24 bottles are tightly stoppered with them newfangled metal bottle caps. Sorry, Mr. Anheuser only recently developed the bottle cap. Mr. Bush hasn't begun to think about the twist yet. Nobody will miss this key to the church since the church is never locked anyway. But doesn't it have an unusual shape? With muscles bulging from years of grappling with childproof caps, you deftly wield the church key and wrench the tops from all the beer bottles. Score! Located on this rocky hillside is Madame Overy's place of business, a custom-built body house built in the fashion of the pastel gothics. Of course, they had to get the rocks off the property before they could build here. The wood on the outside of the brothel is chipped, rotting, and nearly useless. In other words, like some of the ladies inside, it's nearly ex-siding. Ye old ore house usually isn't open during the day. Wait until dark, cowboy. Rover earned his name the hard way. He lives from paw to mouth all around town. Whew. That was a close one. Considering the condition of this old bridge, you may only have about three crossings left. These snails are the leading edge of a stampede of imported French escargot recently escaped from a haughty San Francisco restaurant being chased by a posse of snooty San Francisco chefs. They appear to stretch to the horizon and they're heading straight for town. If you don't do something soon to prevent them, they'll slime the entire city. You grab a couple of snails from the front of the pack while imagining the aroma of warm, drawn butter. <laughs> hey! 
Hey, boys, it's Miller time. And with that, you cleverly pour bottle after bottle of Sam Andreas' St. Louis brew into the dusty road in an attempt to divert the stampede. Will it work? Will the snails fall for your ruse? Will they accept a domestic? Slurping their little hearts out, if snails may be said to slurp or to have hearts for that matter, the little guys follow your lead straight over to the cliff beside Blackwater Creek. Isn't that cute? They're so gullible. Don't they look just like little lemmings marching over that cliff? <laughs> Local insect population has been thriving, what with all the dry weather coarse gold's been having lately. This is one of the smaller ant hills around the town. Look out, Freddy! Engines! No, wait. This one's an Indian. A real Indian. From India. He sits atop an ant hill surrounded by swarms of ants looking trapped. You feel sorry for him. If there were only some way you could help him. Hello, stranger. I haven't seen you around these parts before. I know it's none of my business, but why are you sitting on top of an active anthill in the heat of this semi-desert sun? Oh, my formal fellow! I am but a weary traveler from a land far, far away, journeying here peacefully merely to experience the curative powers of your local mineral waters. The other members of my stagecoach party Claiming a frustration with my excessive verbosity and sesquipedalian inclinations forcefully placed me in my current sitting position on this lovely feature of your landscape, knowing full well that because of religious reasons I would be unable to climb down by myself. How cruel those Yosemite-bound tourists are! My name is Frederick Farkas. I own the local pharmacy here in Gold. How do you do, Mr. Farkas? My name is Srini Lalkaka Bagnish. Pardon me if I don't get up. Hmm, I've been considering taking on a loyal Indian sidekick. I'm seeking a new assistant down at the pharmacy. Would you be considering a relocation to this area? You know, Coarse Gold offers extremely reasonable housing costs and an abundance of sunny weather and is close to schools and churches. Well, no. Not really, but yes. Perhaps I would be willing, but as you can readily see, I'm quite busy at this current moment. Have you considered climbing down and walking away? I cannot possibly do that. Life is sacred. If I were to move, I should indubitably injure some of these small six-legged life forms. I'm sure someone will come along soon to the aid of me. I'll see what I can do, Srini. What sort of cad would steal a ladder from the school playground? Oh, you would. I've got it, Srini. I know how I can help you. Here you go, partner. Hoof your way across this. Score! Oh, my balance sense is stretching now. You made it! Oh, thank you, Mr. P. You saved me! Please don't call me that. Thank you again, Mr. F. I am so much grateful. Oh? Grateful enough to accept the assistance position I mentioned earlier? I could really use some help around the shop. I would be honored. Where do I begin? 
So Freddy headed on back to the pharmacy, followed by the eternally grateful Srini Lakaka Bagnish. Seems like Freddy not only found himself a new assistant at the pharmacy, but also a good friend as well. So as my assistant, I want you to help me around the store, clean up, you know, the usual chores. Oh, I would be highly gratuitous of your bending over to display me such a position. Would you be offering as well a form of payment? I'll pay you ten cents a day and all the rustler's stove chocolates you can eat. That is an agreement. Excellent. Uh, um, what was your name again? Srini Lakaka Bagnish. But you may call me Srini, and I will be calling you Freddy. Okay? Okay, now let's get cracking, Srini. I'd like you to go out there and create some nice displays for the skin lotions. We may be closed temporarily, but we'll be opening sooner or later, and we've got to be ready. What it is, Freddy? I will be getting on that now. Srini! Dude! Everything going okay in here? What is it looking like? I am having everything under control. You have merely to go to be a hero and I will continue holding up the fort. Thanks. Mind the store, won't you, Srini? I'm off to uphold justice and stuff. Okie the dokey. Hey buddy, no cutting. It's people like you that give people like you a bad name. Well, howdy, Mr. Farkas. Uh, I was just leaving, I swear. G g give me one more minute. Perfectly okay, Billy. No need to get up. Just scoot over a little. Uh, well, I... <laughs> Jeez, Mr. Farkas. Invade my personal space, why don't you? A few moments later, you emerge feeling refreshed. Gee, that water's got a nasty kick to it. The door to the outhouse is the only part they got right. The rest of it is a real half-assed job. The sign says, I'm an Untertaker, and you're not. A few buzzards have landed here, waiting for some unfortunate life form to become Vulture Chow. Cedric the Owl looks lost and out of place in the hot desert sun. If you listen close, you can almost hear him say, 
Freddy, if you're going to go in there, I'm going to wait out here. He always has some flimsy excuse. Hey, you! You can almost hear Cedric squawk. I'm waiting here. It's too dangerous out there. Apparently some adventurer is out in the desert and the owl's waiting to annoy him when he gets back. Oh, a child is playing by the side of the bridge. How delightful. The rusty tracks of the fish camp and Pacific Railroad used to continue across the trestle here and wend their way to exciting, far-off places like Fresno. The train doesn't come here anymore ever since the trestle collapsed and the train sunk into the swamp. No more lumber shipments, no more ice deliveries, no more personal hygiene products. Poor Sam Andreas. It's a good thing he waters down his whiskey so much or else all his profits would be consumed by glaziers. A gigantic pile of 50-pound sacks of bacon soda fills the sidewalk in front of your store, nearly blocking the entrance. The baking soda is the famous Leg and Hammer brand, named for the famous international industrialist. His slogan? Keep one sack in the smokehouse and another in the stable to help keep it clean and fresh smelling. Summoning up superhuman strength, you heft the huge pile of baking soda. Then with a horrible wrenching, tearing sound, you cram the sacks of baking soda into your pants pocket. You intended to order one sack of baking soda. Owing to an administrative error, you are now the proud possessor of 144 sacks of baking soda and the superhuman strength required to carry it around. How gross. You return. Yep. It is good to look upon your eternally smiling countenance a face again. Yeah, yeah, I've missed you too. The chemical warms slowly over the alcohol lamp. Now it's getting pretty hot. Good thing your calluses are thick. The chemical rapidly reaches a full rolling boil. You quickly lick your fingers and pinch out the alcohol lamp's flame. Carefully label the bottle, 
Visalicylate antitoxidine. Congratulations. Be careful, this stuff is mighty concentrated. Mind the store, won't you, Srini? I'm off to uphold justice and stuff. Okie the dokey. This tank stores the whole town's drinking water supply. Score! You grab the ladder. That just doesn't work like that. Remembering your father's advice about never using the topmost rungs of a ladder, you stop just short of the ladder top. There's a small hatch on top of the water tank. You can't reach the water tank hatch from down here. A short, strong metal pole projects from the roof of the water tank. You snare the tower top. The crowd eats it up. Who's the schmuck with the rope? Be careful you don't put an eye out. Score! Ah, scratching right there sure feels good, eh, Freddy? As you reach the top of the water tower, the crowd cheers. Thank God, it's Freddy! We're number one! We're number one! What are you gonna do now, Freddy? I'm going to Sierra Land! Boing! That one hit a 9.0 on the free plug -a meter There's a small hatch on top of the water tank. Carefully pour the purification solution into the town's water supply. Excellent job. It weren't more than a few hours before the folks of Coarse Gold was feeling a whole heck of a lot better. Their bowels were all settled down and happy. Freddy knew he could relax now. Everything was calm and peaceful. But round about midnight, that very same night, trouble struck again. Freddy was in his own bed, sound asleep, when... Fire! Fire, Freddy Farkas! Please come urgently! Wh what's wrong, Srini? A tragedy is becoming... The assay office is aflame. She is burning with a might more severe. The pharmacy may be next alighted. Get dressed as soon as possible. I am dressed. I don't own pajamas. Take mine. No, wait. There is no time to perform such an effort. Just hurry and scheme in such a way so as to extinguish the most threatening fire. Uh, 
Queenie, are you going to help me put out that fire or what? There is much stock work yet to be done. It's midnight. I am still on Pakistani time. That's a pretty poor excuse for not helping me put out that fire. I have many other excuses ready, if you do not like that one. Oh, never mind. I'll do it myself. Mind the store, won't you, Srini? I'm off to uphold justice and stuff. Okie the dokie! The old abandoned assay office is ablaze, threatening to burn down not only itself and your pharmacy, but the whole town. It's a long plank firmly attached to some sort of axle, allowing one side to pivot upwards while the other side descends. When kids play on it, one of them teeters at the top and the other totters at the bottom. Say, you've got an idea for what you could call this thing. A kitty pult. You're not quite skillful enough to make a perfect three-point landing from the swing to the seesaw without breaking every bone in your body. In other words, try it and you'll be the man with the flopping trapezium. You're not quite... What pluck, what prowess, what a ridiculous solution. Still, you thought of it. You single-handedly quenched the flames of the assay office by using the seesaw as a catapult for the baking soda. Too bad nobody was here to see it. They'll never believe you in the morning. The charbroiled and blackened remains of the old abandoned assay office stand on the corner of Maine and Education. You suspect that this was the work of either whoever's behind all the destructive goings on in town, or voracious Louisiana chef Paul Prudhoe. The boss is more than a little upset. Seems that our friend has been thwarting every plan so far. Yep. Something's gotta be done about it. Absolutely. Now, let's get down to business. What is the best way to get rid of our little problem permanently? How about hanging? Oh, too quick and merciless. Poison? Nah, too unsure. Ancient Egyptian dagger. I can't find mine. Got one on you? Not at the moment. It don't matter how we do it, so long as we do it soon. And we don't want no proof it was us, neither. And nothing to connect it with the boss. 
excellent thought. And the boss has arranged for a bit of muscle to come in and make sure the entire town's cleaned out PDQ. We'll be rid of that do-gooder and all his flea-bitten friends in no time. <laughs> Laughing cruelly, they sit back to reflect on their villainy. The thought of shift and balance messing around with Madam's working girls makes you thankful you don't participate in any disease trading activities. Am I interrupting anything? Oh, uh, 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 why, of course not, Mr. Farkas. Uh, we were just talking about... Oof. Uh, what he means is we were simply chatting after an invigorating, uh, workout. Sheriff, you know about the fire down at the assay office? Fire? No. You don't say. It's dreadful. Why, if and I'm not mistaken, a fire there could wipe out most of Main Street and take your pharmacy right up along with it. Ooh, one hates to contemplate it. <laughs> Looks like your dear friend Philip has passed on. Gee, it seems like only a day or two ago you filled a prescription for him. Uh-oh. That's a Shears Craftsperson Graveyard Quality Shovel standing in the dirt. Score! Glancing furtively around to see if Doug's within sight, you grab his shovel. This shovel was left at Reboot Hill for the convenience of the grave diggers. Score! You start to dig up the freshly laid grave. Muscles that haven't been used in years begin to groan and whine. But with the gritty determination of a professional grave robber, you toil on. And on. And on. It's an open grave. Even a world-weary, seen-it-all pharmacist like yourself. One who deals with cold sores, headaches, and diarrhea on a daily basis still can't shake that uneasy feeling one gets when standing close to death. You carefully search through the many pockets of Graves' three-dollar suit until you discover the safe deposit box key you entrusted to Phil oh so many years ago. Score! In a touching display of emotion, and a hidden desire to carry a little less around with you, you fold up Philip's letter and place it under his folded hands. I guess this makes Phil a correspondence corpse.
A stack of naughty French postcards sits on the coffee table in order to titillate some of the less forward customers. Howdy, Chastity. Howdy to you, you big old sloppy hunk of manly macho woman loving man. Laying it on a little thick tonight, aren't we? Yeah, business is slow, but I gotta keep in practice. Evening, Purity. Evening, Freddy, darling. Has Madam still got you under lock and key, or you gonna let us get a hold of you one of these days, big boy? I'm afraid I'm all hers, for the time being. Well, if you ever change your mind, honey, you know where to find us. Mm -mm. And when, and how often, and for how much. Bah ha 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 ha! Translation How much do you charge anyway? Translation I'm sheep at twice the price. Ba 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 ba. Translation Sounds like a deal. Translation Yes, I cost next to mutton. A brass cuspidor, known as a spittoon, sits next to the plush red velvet armchair. Spittoons for Freddy Farkas, Frontier Pharmacist, furnished by Louis Lugie, Flemmy Mass. Howdy, Miss Virtue. You sure are a vision of loveliness. Thank you ever so much, Freddy. And you, sir, are a study and buff. What does that mean? Just that you're the manliest prescription-filling man I did ever see. Oh, thank you. Score! You snatch the French postcards. Madam set out some wine and glasses. A few drinks helps the customers loosen up. The girls are already loose enough. No, wait, the customers drink wine and get tight, and the girls aren't. Oh, never mind. This chamber leads into Madame's private boudoir. No unaccompanied males allowed. It's just a large statuette of Schmiros, the god of can't we just be good friends. You'd love to sit and chat, but you're not here for relaxation. Ooh, Freddy, when you touch me, I get all weird inside. Hope you mean it. Hey, Mona Moore. It's about time you showed up. Ready to take my pharmacy bill out in trade? Sure. Then get over here before I have to come get you, little pumpkin. I think you should leave. Why, Sadie? Just because I'm using you for cheap, tawdry pleasure when my heart belongs to Penelope Prim, the gorgeous, young, obviously more virtuous new town school mom? What? Who? Oh, <laughs> nothing. Never mind. What were you saying? Oh, I was just saying, I think you should leave. Leave town, that is. There's... Oh, it's so tragic. Oh, Friday, there's just no easy way to say this. The girls say the sheriff and the banker talk in their sleep. They hate you, Freddy. They want you dead. They're out to get you. 
Something about you foiling the plan and how they had to get you out of the way. You have to run, Freddy. You have to get out of town by sundown. Now, don't you worry, Sadie. I've been doing a pretty good job up till now, using just my wits and my pharmacological knowledge, haven't I? I'm not gonna just turn tail and run and leave you and Penelope and Coarse Gold behind me to fend for yourselves. You're not listening to me, Freddy Falkus. There's man a coming. Man with guns. Big guns. Guns with long barrels. Long, hard barrels. Long, hard, steely barrels. And low slung holsters. And. and. Uh, oh, sorry. Sadie, snap out of it! Oh, sorry. I was just visualizing. Anyway, you'll never be able to outthink men with guns. If you're set on staying in town, you'll have to, you know, go back to your old ways. That's out of the question. I left gunslinging behind me years ago. I'm not like that anymore. And I don't want to discuss it. Stop it. You gotta choose, and that's all there is to it, hon. Either leave town and save your hide, or pull yourself together and face reality. Quit talking about potions and liniments. They're not gonna stop no bullets. It's time to get off for your cute little butt and give these men a taste of frontier justice. Now, what are you gonna do? I don't know. I don't know. Hold me, Sadie. Press me to your ample bosom, and let me decide tomorrow. You got it, hon. Now, let's see, where was I? Oh, that's right. Madam Overy begged and pleaded with Freddy to either leave town or take up his old gunslinging ways, something which Freddy was just a mad reluctant to consider. So they decided to sleep on it. And though they didn't get much sleep, Freddy did mull it over somewhat. The next morning, he decided to... <coughs> maybe I, I better... <coughs> Wait, maybe I better... <coughs> Never mind. <coughs> Just go on, go on. <coughs> Penelope. Coarse gold. Madam Overy. I know I've got to get out of this town before they gun me down, but I can't! Coarse Gold's my home, and darn it to heck, I'm not gonna let some cheap criminals run me out of my home! Oh, Sadie's right. I've got to be the man I once was. I've got to dredge up my ugly past, meet it square in the face, stare it down, pick it up, dust it off, fluff it up, and put it on again! <coughs> Your old hat and gunslinging outfit. And, hmm, it smells of camphor. Score! You take your old gunslinger clothes and your good guy model Stetson hat. Trini, who let you in? Your most gracious Native American, running gag, permitted me egress from the outside of the street. It was then that I allowed him to knock himself off for the remainder of the day, since we are still closed. That's fine, Srini. Look, I've reached a decision. My life is in danger. Ah, oh, heck, the whole town's in danger. 
I must take up gunslinging, and I'll need your help. Pardon us for being said, Freddy Farkas, but you are a humble pharmacist. Shooting as most perfectionally as a gunslinger is a skill requiring most years of tireless practice. You are ill-equipped. Perhaps you should make peace with your chosen deity and prepare to go to the great pharmacy counter in the sky. Srini, you'll have to trust me on this. I used to be a gunslinger before I took up pharmacology. If I did it before, I can do it again. It shouldn't take long to brush up my skills. I've just got to find my guns and do a little practice shooting. Very well, Freddy Farkas. When you are prepared, meet me at the edge of town and together we shall practice what little must be left of your shooting skills. Yes? You don't need any of these items, and even if you did, they're expired. Mind the store, won't you, Srini? I'm off to uphold justice and stuff. Okie the dokie! That's Gluteus Maximilian and his horse, who appears to be wearing one of those hilarious whoopee saddles. They call him Gluteus because he's the butt of every practical joke in town. Hey, Max. Max ignores you, but he seems to flinch a bit. Perhaps he thinks you're in on yet another nasty prank. Those flies are really enjoying that byproduct. These remnants of the coarse gold depot are all tumbled down and shot. Score! You bravely, stupidly grab the steaming fly laden horse plop. Fortunately, it seems to be holding together well as you place it in your pocket. It's an open grave. Even a world-weary, seen-it-all pharmacist like yourself, one who deals with cold sores, headaches, and diarrhea on a daily basis, still can't shake that uneasy feeling one gets when standing close to death. What are you looking for? Gold fillings? Come on, you've defiled filled graves unfilled grave enough already. Score! You grab a handful of clay from the pile beside the grave. Well, you never know, it could come in handy. A robust, healthy, prickly pear cactus grows near the edge of Reboot Hill. Must be all the nitrogen-rich fertilizer in the local soil. Sitting behind the counter is P.H. Balance, current owner and operator of the Bank of Bob. He's a bore and a lice-infested jerk. Come again? Did you say something, Farkas? I said you were more than just a nice, respected clerk. Oh, that's very different.
This is the key to your safe deposit box, pried from the cold, rigid fingers of your dead pal, Phil. Score! You hand the safe deposit box key to P.H. Balance. It'll be ready Tuesday. Oh, I mean, allow me to fetch your safe deposit box for you immediately. These are your two gunslinger pistols, left over from your salad days. You know, those days when you were still green. Score! You lovingly lift your pistols from the box where they've spent the past decade. You'd forgotten. You used your old lucky neckerchief to wrap those pistols in. You take your lucky neckerchief out of the safe deposit box. Now you're really beginning to feel lucky. Wait a minute. The last time I wore this was when Kenny shot off my ear back in St. Louis. Well, okay, so maybe it's not that lucky a neckerchief. Oh, I'm all done now. Thank you for using the Bank of Bob. How can we put this delicately? It's a fragrant, freshly baked road apple. Look what you've done! Freddy Focus, I'll see you run out of town for this! Hop sing, hop to it! Get out here and clean up this mess! Damn these flies! Oh, <laughs> you're in big water now. Score! Score! Good move, Freddy. Drop in one steaming hot pie to get another. It ain't going nowhere. This combination barbershop and dental emporium is under the exclusive proprietorship of Salvatore O'Hanahan, coarse gold's only Italian-Irish barber. Sal didn't really want a buffalo head mounted on his wall, but when it ran through the back of the building, he decided to just leave it. You're certainly happy it's not winter now. When Sal cranks up the heat in this baby, you can smell the memories of hundreds of miners, many of whom are now long dead. Or at least smell that way. Once this lamp burned whale oil. But you know how hard it is to find whales around here. Those old boots look vaguely familiar. 
That canister is labeled NO2. Fletcher Castoria, the town plumber, sits here patiently waiting for his turn in the chair. Got nothing else to do since nobody in Coarse Gold has plumbing. Hey Fletcher, how's the plumbing business? He doesn't respond. Apparently he's too engrossed in reading the latest copy of the Scoocher Down and Examiner. Hey, I put out a fire last night and, and saved the town. Proud of me? Of course I'm a proud of you. It's a tattered, well-worn claim check, nearly brown with age. Score! Sal, do you still have that pair of boots I dropped off for a shine? I know it's been about six years now, but I just remembered I left them here. Hmm, let me see. What's the number on this claim check? Hmm, let me look under the counter here. Yep, still here. Have them ready for you next Tuesday. Oh, never mind. I'll just take them as is. Uh, don't worry about the storage charges, okay? Oh, these passenger pigeon skin boots bring back memories of the days before Kenny the Kid gave you an ear job. Hmm. There's nothing like a steaming hot cup of joe from Mom's Cafe, brewed from mountain-grown beans from the steep-sloped hills of Jamaica. Much better than them shoddy trench-grown coffee beans from the shallow-sloped ditches of Peoria. Oh, there's nothing quite like Mom's apple pie. Now, someone would just invent baseball. Voila! Instant Americana. Wow, if your old neckerchief could only talk, boy, the stories this baby would tell. Ooh la la and va va voom. No, that's not an exclamation. That's the names of the two ladies prominently featured on Madame Spicy French postcards. Or rather, they're the two ladies with the prominent features on Madame Spicy French postcards. Your old pistols, looking somewhat tarnished after so many years in storage, are probably still quite serviceable. It's the Honorable Sheriff Checkham P. Shift trying to invent coffee and donuts. That's an old trunk dated back to the 1870s. Actually, in that case, it's pretty new. Those are the Sheriff's six guns. Actually, they're revolvers and rifles, but there are six of them. Sheriff, I'm going to be saying my goodbyes soon. And I just wanted to thank you for all your help. Don't mention it, boy. If I can do anything to make your departure more hasty or pleasant, feel free to ask. That just doesn't work like that. Score! Say, Sheriff. I know how much a law enforcement person like yourself enjoys a good, hot cup of coffee every now and then. Thanks, partner. But you know what? Something sweet would sure taste good right now. Why, I bet that's true. I'll be glad to try and find you something to munch on. But in the meantime, I've been thinking about moving to another city. But I've got no bullets. I was wondering if you have any bullets that would fit an old 45. Why sure, son, here. Have a box of these Remington. No charge, they're on the county. <laughs> Tons of ammo, hot lead, hollow points. Dum-dums. Here you go, Sheriff Shift. 
I found some of Mom's nice hot apple pie for you. I know how much a law enforcing person like yourself enjoys sweet fatty breakfasts. Well, thank you. I've been so hungry, I could have had a bar. This will sure go good with that cup of coffee you brung me earlier. Uh, Sheriff, do you have anything I could use to clean these old guns of mine before I leave town? They're mighty dirty and I want to be prepared for my long journey. Okay, son, but this gun cleaning kit will be the last thing I give you. Now, get your guns cleaned, get your horse packed, and get your ass out of my town. You slip the bullets in the chamber as the old memories come rushing back. Wouldn't a few featuring you and your first cousin out behind the barn when you were both curious eight-year-olds. Sheriff Shift was so nice to give you his gun cleaning kit. He may be a low-down, evil, corrupt, two-time and no-good varmint, but he's got the cleanest pistol in town. Or so says Madam Overy. After removing the bullets, you clean and polish your pistols till they shine like a coarse gold kid with his first passing grade. Good thing you removed all that rust from your barrel, a damn thing could have exploded right in your face. When you're done, you replace the bullets in the chamber. Score! Srini's waiting for you to start your target practice. Well, Srini, I think I'm ready to try some target shooting. You ready? Uh, certainly. I am without a desire to wait any further to stand in front of your blazing guns and take my life in your hands to help you perfect your shooting. How do you want to start? Perhaps it would be besting if you place some targets upon the fence posts for a commencement. Okie the dokie, Freddy Farkas. First we shall see if you can successfully strike the bottles from afar with the bullets of your pistol. Then. I will toss the bottles up in the air and you may try to hit them in flight. Good luck and may the best man win. Very good, Freddy Farkas. Let us try some quick drawing. Just make sure you hit the target and not me. Score! I'm uploading myself inside. Now for the big challenge. Six bottles all at once. Say, Freddy Farkas, you are not so bad after all at this shooting gig. Why, thanks, Srini. My life and the lives of every man, woman, and ruminant in this town depend on my being quick with a gun. Did you not mention earlier that your life is in danger most forthcoming? Something like that. Might I then suggest that you might be excellent to placing a disguise upon your person, thereby making it to appearances that Freddy Farkas has no longer around in this locality. 
Good thinking, Srini. I'll need a disguise of some sort, something that will strike terror into the hearts of the bad guys. I know, a bat. I'll disguise myself as a bat, and you can be Srini, the boy wonder. Do you have any leotards? Pardon me for asserting, but this bat thing is really hokey. Ah, you're right. Too juvenile. Let's see. How about... Might I suggest a skin-tight costume with flowing cape and placed upon the manly chest thereof a large F for Farkas? Nah, that'd never work. I don't want people to know I'm Freddy, remember? Then perhaps you are needing to do something about that right ear. Or, rather, the lack of that right ear. Dang it, you're right. Everyone knows me as the one-eared pharmacist. I need to make a new one somehow. Maybe forge one out of metal or something. I'll give it some thought and meet you back at the pharmacy once I've completed my disguise. The door swings open. From the back, you hear Chester's voice. Help yourself. I'll be right out. Hiya, Whittlin' Willy. How'd the gunslinging go? Great. I'm getting ready to leave town now. Drop the leaving town bit, Sonny. I know what you're up to. This is my story, remember? Oh, yeah. Now finish putting that disguise together and get to it, so we can get this town cleaned up once and for all. Hey, you don't have to tell me twice. This puddle of candle wax from the church is suitable for chewing, but it tends to lose that churchy flavor after only a couple minutes. That just doesn't work like that. Score! Willie, I'm in need of a way to disguise my ear. Do you think you could do something creative with this? Something in the shape of an ear, perhaps? Offhand, I'd say do it your dang self. My nap time's coming up shortly. I've had a hard day of whittling. But you could maybe do some lost wax casting with this sucker, and that'd do the trick. Lost what? Lost wax casting, son. What'd you do, sleep your way through metal shop? I guess I must have. What's lost wax casting? That's casting with an apostrophe, sonny, not an I-N-G. Anyhow, you can make all sorts of things by making a wax positive, using clay to make a mold, then melting down the metal and pouring it into a mold. To make a mold, you carves whatever you want to cast out of wax, see? That's what we call a positive. Now once you got the wax positive, you take some clay, see, and you pack the clay all around the positive. You just leave a little hole at the top so you can get the wax out. So now you got your wax inside the clay. Well, you just heat that sucker up till the wax goes all oozy and you pour the wax out. That's the lost wax part, see? Now you got your empty clay mold, what we call a negative. You smelts down your metal and pours the metal into the negative. Once it hardens up, you can just scrape off the clay and there you are. Did you get all that? I think so. I'm not sure. Well, that's what your restore button's for, kiddo. Now, scrambooch!
A crudely lettered sign reads, Mom's Cafe done been closed by order of the sheriff. Health code violations is all the reason he needs. Rollin', 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 got to keep on rollin'. The door swings open. From the back, you hear Chester's voice. Help yourself. I'll be right out. It's Whitland Willie's authentic Whitland knife. Score. You borrow Whitland Willie's knife for a while. You return. Yep. It is good to look upon your eternally smiling countenance of face again. Yeah, yeah, I've missed you too. It's a silver medallion recently awarded to Srini by the American Society of Salves, Holistic Ointments, Liniments, and Emollients Salesmen. It was in honor of his impressive and yet oddly comforting display of old Gampy's fisherman throat gullet descaler lozenges. Score! You carefully remove the medallion from the wall. Srini will never miss this. Pretty Farkas, what in an entirely unsatisfactory afterlife are you doing with my finely earned silver medallion? It's going to a good cause, Srini. It's going to help make Coarse Gold a safer, saner place to live. I am hoping so, Freddy, for all the six. These Confederate Army penknife replicas are becoming quite popular among the more sophisticated Whitlers. With your newly acquired Whitland skills, you carve the candle wax into the shape of an ear, one that should theoretically attach snugly to the remains of your original ear. But now look at the gunk on Willie's knife. I'll toss this knife over here where Willie might find it. He'll probably think he dropped it here. Yeah, sure. This handsomely carved wax ear looks very much like the one that bastard Kenny the Kid shot off so many years ago. Hmm? You carefully pack the clay in and around the wax ear leaving a small opening so that you can pour out the molten wax later. This clay mold still contains your original wax positive of your ear. The wax in the mold slowly starts to melt. The melted wax runs out of the mold and spatters on the work table, resulting in an empty ear-shaped mold and a table with a severe case of waxy buildup. It's Srini's 99.9% .9 silver medallion 
awarded to him by the American Society of Salves, Holistic Ointments, Liniments, and Emollients Salesmen. The silver medallion slowly begins to melt. The medallion is nearly completely melted now. You now have a crucible containing molten silver. You quickly pour the molten silver into the empty mold. Your ear mold ugh, is now filled with the melted silver from your award medallion. You know they're not going to send Srini another medallion. You scrape the clay off and discard it, leaving you with a gleaming silver ear. Beautifully done. With an ear like this, you could, dare I say it, rule the world! <laughs> Score! It's your soon-to-be-world-famous silver ear, symbol of truth, justice, and the pharmacological way. You quickly lick your fingers and pinch out the alcohol lamp's flame. Score! With your boots, your clothes, your guns cleaned and loaded, your silver ear and your lucky neckerchief, you're ready to get dressed and assume your identity as the gunslinging stranger. You return to your penthouse suite high atop the glitter in Farkas Pharmacy in beautiful downtown Korsgold. There, Srini greets you and solemnly assists you in the final preening. It's a somber and yet somehow exciting event. There you are, Freddy Farkas. You are mostly indeed a picture of stately, mysterious strangeness. Nobody will be positive to recognize you now at any time or place. Thanks for your help, Srini. Coarse Gold owes you a debt of gratitude it can never repay. If anyone asks, Freddy Farkas has left town. And if I don't come out of this alive, the pharmacy is yours. That is of a true generous nature you are displaying, Freddy Farkas. As for me, I would like to open a pharmacy on the reservation among my people. But whether that is fated to be or not is in the hands of someone who is not I. Luck be with you, Freddy Farkas. I am proud. stage was set for Freddy's showdown. Wait, did I say slow down? I meant showdown. No, no, no. I did say showdown, didn't I? I thought I did. Weren't sure. Anywho, now that Freddy was wearing his silver ear thing and his old gunslinging duds, nobody except Srini recognized him. Not even Sadie Overy or Penelope knew who he was. They thought Freddy had skipped town, and they thought this new guy was just a handsome, silver-eared stranger who happened to be especially up on his pharmacology. Now, Freddy didn't have a lot of time to lose because things in Coarse Gold was getting worser and worser. You've never seen Chester Field look so downtrodden. Why, he looks like he's lost his best friend. He's wearing a sandwich board upon which has been very hastily scribbled, We'll polish ears for stagecoach fare. Hoping Chester won't recognize you with your new disguise, you approach him with a friendly smile. 
Say, partner, that's a woeful little sign you're carrying there. We'll polish ears for stagecoach fare. What's the problem? Why so down on your luck? Well, I'll tell you. Even though I don't usually talk to silver-disguised strangers, there's a man inside who's the best damn poker cheat I've ever seen. I never even knew he was stealing my store till it was all over. You see, I bet everything I owned, including my store, on a queen high straight flush. And that bastard had a king high. Don't feel bad, fella. I would have probably done the same. By the way, did you get this gambler's name? Name? Sure did. Wheaton Hall's his name. Everybody calls him Aces, and I can see why. Thanks for your time, and I hope things work out for you. I think I might just pay Mr. Aces a little call. Good luck to you, stranger, especially if you're gonna get in that game. Thanks. I'm wearing my lucky neckerchief, so I'm not too worried. Yeah? But are those blood stains there? Zircon Jim Laffer. Years from now, his brother Ezekiel will sire a son, who will beget Ethan, who will beget Bartholomew, who will beget Lawrence. That's right, he's Leisure Suit Larry's great-great-grandfather. Howdy, stranger. New in town? Hi, I sure am, and I'm looking for a hot time. <laughs> I've been noticing some of your fine, coarse gold fillies. <laughs> I wouldn't mind an introduction. Perhaps you could put in a good word for me with one of them. Of course, I know a lot of you boys gotta pay for your fun, but uh, I figure a guy with my looks and breath, hey, they should be paying me, you know? <laughs> right? Right. Uh, by the way, my name's Laffer. Zircon Jim Laffer. <laughs> Don't believe I caught yours. Oops, I think I smell something burning, or something. Catch you later. What rock did he crawl out from under? Sam, what the devil is going on here? Do I know you? How could you let this, this scoundrel swindle people out of their homes and life savings? And you are... I'm fri... Uh, wait a minute, no, never mind. You don't know me. But the folks of Coarse Gold are losing their shirts to this lying, thieving, cheating, low-down, no-good, scum-sucking drifter. Please, sir, don't talk that way about the saloon's new owner. Yes, well, I just work here now. If you have any complaints or suggestions, feel free to put them in writing. I'll be happy to pass them along to the new management. Don't bother him, he's sleeping it off. Then when he wakes up, he'll have a hair of the dog that bit him and the cycle will begin anew, like the miracle of life itself. Wheaton Aces Hall, slick, big-time back-east riverboat gambler, has turned the saloon's friendly poker game into vicious, high-stakes gambling, winning money, land, buildings, and businesses from the local bumpkins. Gambling away his keg and barrel shop is Cooper Coop Cooper. He, his wife, his children, and his parents all work in his barrel shop. He's a Cooper, she's a Cooper, they're all Coopers. Wouldn't you like to be a Cooper, too? That's old Ollie Oxenfree, up close and personal. He's the guy who owns the fig farms on the northern side of Collier Bluff. He's the worst gambler in town. He'll lose the entire North 40 in no time. That's Joe, the guy that had a bad time with old Muff Potter a few years back. He owns a local tourist trap that really is a trap. He trapped a couple of punks in there a few years back. Tom and Becky something or other. They almost didn't get out. You know, somebody ought to write a book about it. 
That's Muff Potter. Nice to see him and Joe getting along again. He owns, or at least he did own until he started playing, a huge tract of land along the south side of town where Chinatown used to be. This is the poker table. Jesus is holding his cards tightly. One of his hands appears unusually stiff. Maybe he's nervous? Hey son, keep your hands off the table and don't make me tell you again. Score! You're cheating. That's a fake left hand. Your real hand is hidden under the table. You've been feeding good cards into your hand and taking away the bad ones. Why, yes, silver-eared stranger, you're correct. Almost. As you see, I have no cards under the table. I only have this. Now turn around, silver ear. I think I'd rather shoot you in the back so I don't have to see that ugly face of yours. What a manly man, riverboat gambler in the corner pocket. Yeehaw! I could have done that if I'd wanted to. Um, I just didn't feel like it, that's all. Now, when the townsfolk caught wind of how Aces had been cheating, the sheriff had no choice but to arrest him and return all the deeds. But wouldn't you know, no sooner had one brouhaha died down than another flared up. Howdy, stranger. New in town? Hi, I sure am. And of course, I know a lot of you boys got... Oops, I think... What rock did he crawl out from under? Don't go out on the street now, Salvatore. There's a lot of shooting and nastiness going on out there. Well, thanks for the warning, stranger. Much obliged. <laughs> Don't go out on the street now, Salvatore. Well, thanks for the warning, st Salvatore O'Hanahan, town barber, dentist, and boot black, is hard at work on his customer, Ed Sorbine Jr. Salvatore also happens to be the only Irish-Italian in town. Don't French postcards. You don't know where those postcards have been. Score. You hand Salvatore your French postcards. Your customers may not be able to read, Salvatore, but I bet they would enjoy looking at pictures. Oh, no, no, they're not interested in... Wait a minute. What in the hell are those girls doing? I'm not sure, but I don't think it's legal on this side of the Sierra Nevada. Well, no, your exceptional generosity's got to be reciprocated. Could I be interested to you in a free shave? No, thank you, Sal. Uh, then, how about a free wisdom tooth extraction? Oh no, <laughs> mine are already out. Had them pulled in the dental department while I was in college. Needed the extra money for tuition. 
Okay, well then, uh, uh, let me see. W what I got in here that'd be a suitable swap? Uh, uh, oh, hi, hi, there we go. Uh, 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 take this bottle of that newfangled nitrous oxide I got off the Fars Wilgo wagon last week. Ain't none of these guys around here wants to be the first man to sissy to stand up to my forceps for a little old tooth pulling. Why, thank you, Salvatore. Perhaps I can use this in some of my experiments. You encounter dozens of rowdy cowhands from that cattle drive outside of town who are carelessly firing their guns everywhere and frightening, not to mention killing, the locals. They shout, let's stampede the women and rape the cattle. Luckily, the rowdy cowboys don't notice you from down below. The fabric has been pre-treated to resist those pesky dust storms, stampedes, flash floods, tsunamis, monsoons, and droughts. This is the key to your safe deposit box, pried from the cold, rigid fingers of your dead pal, Phil. which cost an additional $1.25. It was never used. Coarse gold is filled with unromantic cheapskates. You take careful aim with your pistol and slowly squeeze off a shot. You did it! You shot off the canister's valve. Score! <laughs> <laughs> Rooney, Freddy Dunn made them cowhands laugh themselves to death with a well-placed bullet. Of course, he didn't get much time to celebrate. The sheriff and the banker and their unknown employer had figured that the mysterious silver-eared stranger might be just a little too much for them amateur rowdies to handle. So they'd called in some big guns from down south, just as backup, don't you know? Knock off the sound effects already! What's that rotten smell? Oh no, it can't be. You recognize that smell from your old days as a lawman. More dangerous than Jesse James. Meaner than Johnny Ringo. Deadlier and William Money. 
More fun at cocktail parties in Rooster Cogburn. It's the legendary Lever Brothers. Yep, it's us, handsome silver-eared stranger. And we're here to put you six feet under. Under what? Your fervent prayer is that your few minutes at target practice with Srini will be sufficient preparation for odds like this. With his refurbished shooting skills, Freddy was able to blast the Lever Brothers to smithereens. Now, with those varmints out of the way, Freddy figured that was the end of the story. That somehow the Lever Brothers was responsible for everything that had been going on in town. But Freddy was wrong. The Lever Brothers had been hired for the task of getting rid of Freddy by whomever had hired the cowhands and whomever was in cahoots with Sheriff Shift and P.H. Balance. And no sooner had Freddy's guns stopped smoking than he heard a familiar twang and a few chords of someone's theme music. What was that? Could it be? No. What would he be doing way out here in the middle of nowhere? You haven't heard that chord in years, and yet here it is again. Strangely recognizable after all this time. In your heart you know it must be him. And yet. How did he find you? Will he be fooled by your disguise? Does he still eat paste? Kid, I want you out of town by sundown. Well, sure, stranger. I'll be riding out of town well before sundown. Leaving your sorry carcass for the buzzards to pick apart. Will not. Will too. Not. Two. In. E. I refuse to play this juvenile word game with you. I refuse to play this juvenile word game with you. What are you doing now, repeating everything I say? What are you doing now, repeating everything I say? So that's why they call you Kenny the Kid. Because you are nothing but an immature little child, an anal retentive case of arrested development with an unresolved edible complex and probably codependent to boot. You were a punk when I faced you back in St. Louis, and you're still a punk. Say your prayers, outlaw. Say your prayers, outlaw! Now, cut that out. St. Louis? I didn't know anybody with a silver ear in St. Louis. Yet, somehow you seem vaguely familiar. Maybe we'll have time to compare yearbook photos. In hell! <laughs> Well, you may have knocked the gun out of my hand, hero, but you couldn't stop me from hitting you anyway. Sorry I got a mite sloppy when I pierced your ear. <laughs> Looks like you'll bleed to death in a few seconds. Guess now I can tell Penelope that you won't be interfering with her plans anymore. Penelope? What did he say? Your head's swimming, but you're sure he said Penelope. Could it be her? Could she be the cause of all this? Score! You weakly pull the neckerchief from around your neck. Score! You place your lucky neckerchief on your ear. 
and press on it to staunch the flow of blood. With your last remaining ounce of strength, you pull yourself up and stumble off towards the schoolhouse to see Penelope. Penelope, Penelope the sweet, Penelope my beloved, Penelope the traitor. Freddy dragged his bleeding self over to the schoolhouse. The anger and hurt was just ripping at his gut like a swarm of bot flies on roadkill. Only worse, cause Freddy, unlike roadkill, was still alive. The schoolhouse door was unlocked for once and Freddy walked right on in. When Freddy stepped inside, Penelope was standing at the desk, packing in a hurry. She didn't even notice him come in. Gazing at her like that, Freddy saw her for the conniving snake in the grass she really was. All the bitter hurt and betrayal and rage was too much for Freddy to hold down. It churned around inside of him and finally welled up, bubbling to the surface in a furious storm of outrage. Hey, Penelope, what gives? Oh, why, it's you, the silver handsome-eared stranger. Handsome silver-eared stranger, you mean? Oh, right. I, um, I thought Kenny had taken care of you. <laughs> Are you kidding? He did just the opposite. He hurt me. Just look at my ear. Why, you poor man. You poor, brave cowboy. You're wounded. Here, allow me to tear a strip off my undergarment. Penelope slowly moved her hands up to her bodice and began to carefully unbutton it, one button at a time, staring straight into Freddy's eyes. You know, ever since I saw you capture that big, bad gambler at the saloon, I've been thinking about you. Thinking about how I wanted you. She slowly slipped her hands under the fabric. Could this be my Penelope? Is it hot in here? Or is it just me? And what's with all this echo? Thinking about how I needed you. And before Freddy knew it, Penelope yanked a derringer from her bosom and aimed it at him. Dead, that is. Drop him, gunslinger. Now! You resignedly unbuckle your holsters, letting your gun slip to the floor. Penelope appears to relax a little, but her finger is still on the trigger of the Derringer. Looks like she might shoot at any moment. Score! You grab the slate and whip it around just in the nick of time. As you bend down to pick up your gun belt, Penelope hurls the Derringer straight at your head. Before I kill you, Mr. Gunslingin' Stranger Hero Type, let's just find out who you really are behind that silver ear. Freddy! You? Yes, it's me! No, yes, it is I! Boy, you can take the wicked, villainous, hoodwinking, double-crossing, lying slut out of the school teacher, but you can't take the school teacher out of the wicked, villainous, hoodwinking, double-crossing, lying slut. Why, Penelope? Why? Why on earth have you done all this? Oh, I may as well tell you, you little runt. You know too much for me to let you live. Oh, all right, here goes. I had just finished my education back in western Pennsylvania at the local Meadville Normal School when I saw a small ad on the school bulletin board seeking teachers for a, quote, 
lovely little village way out west, nestled high in the Sierra Nevada mountains. I wrote a letter of inquiry and was offered the position by the Course Gold Board of Education. They even sent me stagecoach fare. Soon after my arrival, which you saw in the prologue, I believe, am I boring you? Oh, good. I noticed the oily swamp behind the schoolhouse. Being a good Pennsylvania oil country girl, I grasped immediately that Course Gold was literally oozing money. But <laughs> I could never afford to buy mineral rights on the meager pittance they pay a single unwed female teacher, so I made a little arrangement with Mr. Balance. He foreclosed whichever mortgages he could and convinced Sheriff Shift to shut down everyone else. Balance would get the land and buildings for a song and give me the mineral rights I wanted, as long as I gave him what he wanted. But Penelope... You seem to be such a sweet, innocent young woman. How could you be such a sleazebag? Well, it had to be me, Freddy, don't you see? It's always the person you least suspect. Well, I didn't suspect Srini. Couldn't it have been him? Well, it's a little late for that now. Wait, wait! I really didn't suspect me! If it's you, then I'm doing the town a favor by disposing of you, aren't I? <laughs> oh, I kill me. Penelope eyes the lantern sitting on the newel post. Oops! How clumsy of me! Oh well, Course Gold won't be needing a schoolhouse anyway. Wait, there were a lot of other people I didn't suspect. Scooch the chair closer and closer to your precious silver ear and just manage to snag it. Score! It's too late to wear that thing. Penelope's already seen through your disguise. Smart thinking. You frantically give the silver ear a few quick rubs on the stone floor. In a trice, the silver ear gets a sharp edge, ragged and rough, but sharp enough to be dangerous. Score! You manage to slice into the ropes with the sharpened silver ear. Score! Justice will be done, madam. Damn, I knew I shouldn't have wasted my time packing those student folders. I shall allow you to choose the manner of your demise. Say what? Oopsie, sorry, you took too long to decide. Penelope grabs one of the swords off the Civil War display above the blackboard. I wonder, did I forget to mention downstairs that Meadville Normal had the nation's first female fencing team? On guard. It appears to be a Confederate sword. You wonder if it's sharp.
It's not a foil, it's a saber. A foil is straight and has two sharp edges, unless it's the smaller French foil which is dull and is used chiefly for thrusting. A saber, like this one, is curved and has one sharp edge. As a teacher and a member of the fencing team, you of all people should have known that. Oh no. Foiled, defeated, and corrected. Now I really feel bad. And thank God for my high school intramural sports program. Otherwise, I'd be Fettuccine Alfredi by now. Score! Hey, it's you! I recognize you now from the old neighborhood. Freddy something. Good to see you again, Kenny. I hope I didn't hurt your hand out there in the street. Whoa, that was you out there? I didn't recognize you. Have you done something with your hair? No, not my hair, Kenny, but this. <laughs> yeah. Hurl in your sharpened ear like a Chinese throwing star. You whip it at Kenny, catching him right in the throat. Score! Yes, sir, by gum, by cracky. With his one good ear all mangled and grody, Freddy managed to leap from the schoolhouse just seconds before it went up in the biggest conflagration course gold had ever seen. The truth came out about Penelope and how she'd been plotting to buy up all the oil rights. There was no earthly way she could have survived the blast. Still, it were curious how they never recovered her body. Sheriff Shift and P.H. Balance were run out of town on a rail. The townsfolks leased the oil rights to some big developers. Soon everybody was rolling in dough, sprucing up the town and revitalizing course gold. Me? I eventually found my whittling knife, all gunked up. I don't remember dropping it. Uh, must have had a spell of stupidity or something. And as for Freddy, well, he made himself another couple of silver prosthesii. One to replace the ear that Kenny just shot off, and one to replace the silver ear that ended up fatally lodged in Kenny's neck. What with all the fuss, Freddy was able to keep his gunslinging identity a secret. And it were a good thing, too, cause Freddy's adventures was far from over. But that little nipper is another story. Now get off my lap. You're starting to compact my vitals. Now the whole town still remembers how the old schoolhouse was blown to embers, though Miss Prim's body was never, ever found. Since the sheriff and the banker made the folks of course gold red with anger, they tarred and feathered and ran them out of town. And Serene, he became an ordinary wreck, salty be shaman down on the Pecos, where engine hearts still burn. While the townsfolk safe from danger Talk about that silver earlobe stranger Where did he come from And when will he return Farkas Freddy Farkas Black gold fields were his legacy Freddy Farkas Freddy Farkas Peerless Earless and free.
Why, Penelope? Why? Why on earth have you done all this? I suppose I can tell you. You know too much already, so I can never let you live. I had just finished my education back in western Pennsylvania at the local Meadville... Oh, wait a second, Josh, can I ask you a question? Cut! <sighs> Shelly, how many times do we have to do this damn scene? It's just that... I don't understand my motivation for this speech. Oh, jeez. I mean, why would Penelope reveal all this to Freddy? Why doesn't she just kill him and get on with it for crying out loud? Just do it, all right? I want to get home tonight. Look, I've got people coming in from the coast. This is about acting, Gil. You wouldn't know anything about that. Shell, it's just a plot device so that the audience understands what's going on. Otherwise, we leave a, a lot of unanswered questions. Oh, can't we just put it in the manual instead, Joshy, sweetie booby, honey? It's just so, so... dull. No, they might read it before they finish the game. Ready to take it again? All right, fine, I suppose. And... action! Oh. oh, God. You hit me again. No, 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 no. You really hit me. Cut! Yes, I'm cut, and I'm bleeding, too. I hope it's serious, you little wimp. Excuse me, can I say something here? I am gonna sue. This is what happened to Margaret Hamilton, you know. Where are you bleeding? My finger. He'll never pick his ear with that finger again. <laughs> oh, you just shut up, Miss Thing. This is all your fault, you know. Can you suffer through one more take, Gil? <laughs> oh, sure, Joshua. And I'll just flee to death. But you'll have your game. That's what you want, isn't it? That's what you really want. That's all this is about. You, you, you. <sighs> all right. Come on, let's do it. What are we waiting for? Come on, people, let's go. <sighs> All right, come on, let's do it. What are we waiting for? Come on, come on, come on, people, let's go. We're losing the light. Gil, use the pain. Direct it at Shelly. All right. Oh, my formal fellow, I am but a weary traveler from a land far, far away. Cut! <laughs> what was a wrong with that? Uh, the accent slipped, babe. Good. <sighs> I didn't hear any Italian creeping in. I thought it was pretty good. You don't like my accent? You call my agent. I can't work under these conditions. I'm going to my trailer. Antonio, don't walk on the ants! Uh. Ants? Ha! <clears throat> That's what I think of your lousy ants. Mike, get Antonio's agent on the phone. Steve, get the rest of the programmers down here. Gil, take five. Double, stunt double. Hey, I said stunt double. I'm not gonna do this jump myself. I could break my neck. I'm going to my trailer. Gil, just do it. Oh, yeah, right. Like that's in my contract. My stunt double is supposed to handle this. She can't, she quit yesterday. Oh, really, why? People, people, work with me here, huh? 
I'm sensing reluctance. Now, please, just do the jump before we lose the assay set, all right? Oh, honey, doesn't this scene take place at night? Well, we're shooting day for night. It's cheaper. The artists will fix it in post-production. Oh, I see. Off the set, Melly! Ooh, but I wanted to watch Gil break his neck. Get out! He's nervous enough about doing the scene without you watching him. Ready, Gil? This is ridiculous. I swear, I will sue if something goes wrong. This is what happened to Margaret Hamilton, you know. Just do it. And action! Ow! Workers' comp! Workers' comp! Cut!